Good morning. Welcome to Heritage Baptist Church. Good to see everybody today. Grab a songbook near you if you would, please. So we get started singing number 246. Number 246. Let's stand together as we sing Higher Ground. Number 246. Sing it out. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay. Where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Let's take a minute and greet those around us this morning. find our way back to our seats. We'll start again. Verse 3. Verse 3, number 246. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane that Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. On the last verse, I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven i found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Good singing. Then turn over to number 99. Number 99. As we sing our chorus of the month, Isn't He Wonderful? Number 99, if you need it, let's sing it out together. Isn't He Wonderful, Wonderful, Wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord Wonderful? have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's word, isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Let's sing that together once more. Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's word, isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Now that you've had your practice and your warm-up, it's time to sing. Page 23. We haven't sung together, you and I, for a little while. Like I said, you're all warmed up. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I'm glad God saved me. And I didn't realize when I got saved that it was more than just I'm going to go to heaven someday. I get to be a part of his family, and, and we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and we get to enjoy that. Let's lift our voices, page 23, starting on the chorus, and just let's give it all we got. Let's look like we're glad. Let's lift it up before the Lord. Here we go. 
I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join hairs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. You will notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and these folks are so near. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain cleansed by his blood. Join hairs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. From the door of an orphanage to the house of a king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong. I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God I belong. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join hairs with Jesus as we travel. One more time, just our voices. Here we go. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join hairs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family the family of God. Hey, Amen. Wonderful singing. It's great to see you this morning. Uh, it seems like it's been a long time. Last week I was in Lewiston, Michigan, uh, trying to encourage uh, Pastor Tony Petronico and his church as he goes through some health trials. Please be praying for him, uh, for them. And uh, I, I tuned in a little bit whenever I could. Live stream is almost non-existent in that part of America. And uh, so I had to kind of hold the phone up real high, and then I couldn't see it. Uh, but I uh, understand the Lord met, and uh, some great things happened here. Uh, if you would, it's good to see Linda Wood back with us today. I asked her, I said, are you all better? And she said, not yet, but getting there. And uh, made my day to see you come in. Beth didn't get a chance to chat with you. How's the patient doing? Mike had knee replacement a week or two ago. Good patient? <laughs> okay. Uh, pray for Brother Mike Vargas as he's recovering uh, from knee replacement. Thank you for the many uh, inquiries about my health. I had the uh, catheterization at the hospital in Massachusetts on Tuesday. Uh, they found that the stent that was placed in February is fractured. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's uh, hindering some blood flow, and that's the cause of the pain. Uh, they did search, found no other blockages or anything like that. Uh, so I'm waiting on a call from a surgeon uh, to see when they're going to go in and, and fix that. Uh, I don't have any answers as to is it an invasive surgery, is it laparoscopic. I have no, no, I don't know what they're doing, okay? I just want them to do it. So uh, that's kind of where we stand. Thank you for praying. Uh, God's got this. He always does, and so uh, we trust in the Lord. How many of you? I always ask the question because it helps me when I go to pray later on uh, through the day and the week. How many of you have something in life and you need some prayer? Anybody? Just lift it up. Please look around. I get to see all of you because I'm in front of you, but, but make sure you just take in the sight. It's part of what families do. Someone said the family that plays together stays together. I believe the family that prays together 
stays together. Let's do that now. Lord, we love you. Thank you for sending your son to be our savior. And when we trusted Christ as savior, we became a part of the family of God. For those of us in this room that are saved, we're gonna spend eternity in the presence of the Lord together. Thank you that we have the privilege of having this part of our journey. As a family, we pray that you'll meet with us, you'll help us bless our church today. Use the word of God, use the music, uh, everything said and done to just encourage our hearts. We come in with so many different needs. We're all at a different place spiritually. We're all facing different battles, but you know exactly what every one of us needs. And I realize there's no such thing as a one sermon that fixes it all, but I pray that today you'll just give every one of us something from the sermon that's meant for us that will help us, challenge us, encourage us, if there's anybody not saved that is in the room listening via the live stream, please draw them to the Lord Jesus today. Many, many unspoken requests. A lot of sick folk going uh, through some trials right now. Please lay your healing hand on each. And give strength and help where it is needed. Father, thank you for being a good God. Crown this service with your presence today and we'll thank you for it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you're visiting with us today, we are honored that you've chosen to be here. Uh, I know you have many choices to make, but if this is your first time here today, our ushers have a little packet of information they'd like to place in your hand. If you just raise your hand where you're seated, they will come and find you. And I know we got one. This is Kathleen sitting right here on the second row uh, visiting with us today and had a chance to meet her before service. Anybody else visiting for the very first time? All right, this is a good summertime crowd. We're happy that you're here. If you did not get a bulletin when you came in this morning, if you raise your hand, a lot of things going on. We'll make a few announcements later on about that. Tonight, you want to make sure that you come back for the evening service. Pastor Zach Kinsman of the New Heights Baptist Church in Newtown, Connecticut is going to be with us. This is literally Connecticut's newest independent Baptist church. Uh, I've known Zach since he was a, a little boy. I've watched him grow up. I uh, started a church several months ago, and, and it is a miracle work. It is amazing what the Lord's doing. He is not here on deputation. He's not here to raise support. Uh, he is a realtor, very successful, and uh, so he's not here to do that. I ask him to come and just share with us uh, a testimony of what God's doing. He's going to preach to us tonight. You will be encouraged in your walk with God to be here tonight. Uh, so that's at 6 o'clock. Please come be a part of it, uh, and, and I know you'll be blessed. Brother Rob, come lead us in one more song. And take your songbooks if you would. Turn to number 215. Number 215. You can remain seated as we sing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Number 215, let's sing it out. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior.
as always, I appreciate your faithfulness, your tithes, your offerings, your, your faith promise. Uh, if you take a gander down into the school wing, all of the classrooms in the uh, educational wing are now carpeted. They finished up uh, late on Friday. Thank you to the dozens of folks who helped us last Sunday evening, empty classrooms out all week long. There were, uh, we had a group of teenagers that came in Tuesday through Friday, uh, just as they finished one room, putting stuff back in, taking stuff out of the next, and then Friday night and yesterday, just getting things set back up. Thank you for that, but God's been very good to us here, and uh, thank you for being faithful in your giving. Brother Stewart, would you pray for the offering, please? Grab your Bibles with me this morning, if you would, and turn to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4 is where we're going to be reading this morning. Once you've found your place in 2 Timothy 4, if you'd stand with me out of respect for God's word, we're going to read the first eight verses of 2 Timothy chapter 4 this morning responsibly. I'll begin verse number 1, and you join me in verse number 2, so on down through verse number 8. The Bible says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith, and read with me verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And let's pray this morning. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you. Uh, Lord, I need something fresh from you today. Lord, I need something new, something fresh from you today. I pray that... Uh, Everyone under the sound of Pastor Bish's voice this morning would pledge right now to not just hear, but to do what you've asked us to this morning, that we'd have willing hearts to uh, receive something from the word of God. I pray that we wouldn't take it for granted, the freedom that we have, the opportunity that we have to hear the word of God. There may come a day when we don't have this, and I pray that we would take advantage of it while we do. And Lord, I love you. Thank you for the opportunity once again. We ask this in your name. Amen. I don't 
don't need to know the end of the story now. I don't need to know the whens, the whys, the hows. But as I keep believing, as I keep on keeping on, let me see the fingerprints of God. The quiet winds of providence press on without restraint. Heaven's hand is moving, though hard for me to trace. Father, hear my heart cry, drum and shine a special beam, and give me little glimpses of the fingerprints you leave. I don't need to know the end of the story now. I don't need to know the whens, the whys, the hows. But as I keep believing, as I keep on keeping keep on, keep on, 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 let me see the, the fingerprints of God. Sometimes the rain will wash away wash the breath that I could see. you ladies. I've already put the request in for tonight, and I've never heard that song before. You know, in the book of Job, for all of Job's questions, and he got to the place where he was complaining. He admitted it, my complaint before the Lord. God never told him why. Nowhere in the book of Job do you find God explaining what happened in the throne room and the challenge that Satan threw down at the feet of God. You never see God saying why this happened to you. What you see is God saying, Job, 
do you trust me? Do you know that I am God and you are not? Will you trust me? And, uh, but, if, but as you go through the Christian life, you always get to look back and everywhere God goes, he leaves a fingerprint. What a great message. I appreciate that. Thank you, ladies. We'll look forward to it tonight. The Apostle Paul was, without a doubt, one of the most remarkable Christians of the entire New Testament church age. In the book of Psalms, we are challenged, mark the perfect man. It doesn't mean if your name is Mark, you're perfect. It means mark the perfect man, check him out, examine him, focus on him. Mark the perfect man, for the end of that man is peace. We find similar challenges in the Bible that as we go through the Christian life, we ought to take notice of those people who have a walk with God that far exceeds our own and learn all that we can from them. In the Bible, the Bible tells us that the lives of these various people were given to us as in samples for us, teaching us what it is to live by faith. And Paul was those, one of those uh, types of individuals. I, I, I admire him. I, I don't say that I'm like him because I, I don't think I even come close to that man. I admire him because of his singular focus. He just had the ability to zone in on the things of God and he never got distracted from that. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13, Paul wrote these words, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I've not arrived yet. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He was just focused uh, uh, like a laser beam on the will of God for his life. His stamina and his fortitude, there was nothing that could stop this man. Uh, he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, are they, talking about the other apostles, ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. He's saying, look, I, I know I sound like I'm boasting. That would be a foolish thing to do. He said, but I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, meaning he had been beaten with a whip more than any of the others, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft he'd been stoned and left for dead. Of the Jews, five times I received, uh, uh, received thy 40 stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, as if that's not enough, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. We leave church if somebody took our seat. We get bent out of shape over the smallest things, and he just read a partial list of, of the things that he endured. But he endured them, and he considered it an honor to, to do those things for the cause of Christ. His strength of conviction... He knew what he believed and he knew why he believed it and nothing would, would, would lead him away from that. In Acts chapter 20, as he met with the elders of the church at Ephesus for the last time, he says this, and now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Saying, in my heart of hearts, the Holy Spirit has convinced me I am supposed to go to Jerusalem. He said, I don't know what's gonna happen there. I don't know what's awaiting me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. I don't know what kind of ministry God has for me there. I just know it's going to end up with me as a prisoner. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. None of these things move me. God had let him know ahead of time, Paul, there are rough days ahead for you. And Paul said, fine, I'm still on board. I wonder if we knew what the next part of our journey was going to be. 
if we would stay faithful to God, we'd continue that journey, especially if there was some kind of a cost involved. Paul said, none of these things move me. The man's sincerity. Paul wasn't doing anything for money. He wasn't doing anything for prestige or popularity. He said in Acts 20, verse 19, he said, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations which befell me, by the lying in wait of the Jews. He wrote in 2 Corinthians 1, our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we've had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. Paul was a sincere man. He was for real. There was no pretense about him. There was no hypocrisy. Paul never had an inflated view of himself. He wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom. He said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. He never stepped behind the pulpit saying, all right, everybody, I just want you to understand the fountain of all wisdom is before you now. He was going up to that pulpit, scared to death, shaking like a leaf, saying, God, if you don't help me, nothing's going to happen today. He was this humble, sincere man that just wanted to please his God. What an amazing person. Paul was unstoppable against insurmountable odds. He was undaunted in the face of pure hatred. Yesterday at our soul winning meeting, we talked about the idea of the third time around. In Acts 14, Paul and his entourage went through a place called Lystra, where they stoned him and left him for dead. Not a real successful ministry by anybody's standards. Um, God either raised him from the dead or God healed him from a near-death experience, but he got to his feet, and they just went off to the next town and the next town after that ministry. And then it was time to go back to Antioch. They turned around, and he went to Lystra again. I don't know about you, I can't speak for you, but if I'd have got stoned in Lister the first time on the return journey, uh, I would have taken a, you know, the bypass. Lister would not have been on, on my, uh, you know, uh, trip planner at all, but he went right back there confirming the, the disciples that they knew were there. And uh, sometime, maybe a few years later, they, they decided to go back to all the places they'd been on the first trip. And he went right back to Lister the third time. By the way, it was the third time where they found Timothy. And Timothy became such a great companion of the Apostle Paul. The third time's the charm, they say. But this was this man, the Apostle Paul. Uh, he was undaunted in the face of hatred, unmovable in his conviction, unwavering in his love. Our love as human beings tends to be very fickle, doesn't it? Very, very fragile. We get disappointed we get betrayed and it's all done, person's written off, they're out of our life forever. Paul wasn't like that, he had a love that was like the love of the Lord Jesus Christ that, that you couldn't really damage it. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he said, and I will gladly, very gladly spend and be spent for you. I'll do whatever it takes for your benefit, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. I know you don't like me. I know you don't love me, but that didn't change the fact that I love you and I'll do whatever it takes for your benefit. What an amazing Christian man. He was unmatched in his prayer life. Read the opening words to every epistle that he penned and you'll find that he prayed for these people in these different churches on a daily basis. Do you realize how, how much time he would have to spend in prayer every single day to cover all of that? He was unending in his quest to know the Lord more deeply. He was unconcerned about his own welfare. He was unequaled in his zeal for God. He was unwilling that any should perish. He was unassuming as to his own talents and merits. He was an amazing Christian man that we have, we have much to learn from. But it's in his final words that he penned on this earth that I want to draw your attention to this morning. As he closes 2 Timothy chapter 4, believed to be the last book that he wrote before he was martyred in the Roman Colosseum, he makes a statement in verse number 6. For I am now ready to be offered. 
And the time of my departure is at hand. The time of my, it's, it's time for me to go. I like to study words. I, I like to look them up and follow the meanings. And that word departure is a very, very rich word. It is a word that describes the loosening of a ship from its moorings so the journey can begin. It means to break down the tent and get ready to move to the next place. It means to remove the chains and to be set free. It means to unyoke the animal from the plow so that it can go home. Paul said, I'm, the time of my departure is at hand. I'm about ready to drop this body behind me and I'm about to go to get a body that'll never perish, that'll never grow old. He said, uh, I am ready to be offered. I have in almost every Bible that I own, this verse underlined or highlighted. Paul said, I am now ready to be offered. We know some truth from scripture. We know from Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse one, to everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. And then there's an extensive list that follows after that in like manner. A time to be born, there's a time to die. Hebrews 9, 27 said, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Now, we know that the Bible teaches that. There was a time for me to be born. In case you're wondering, it's November 21st. The year doesn't matter. It's none of your business at this point. Uh, I am old enough to sign up for Medicare, though. Um, there was a, a day. Now, uh, my parents didn't quite know when I was going to come. They didn't know the, the, the hour or the time of day, but God had it set. There was a time for me to be born, and God knew. And in like manner, the Bible says there's a time to die. There's a time, if the Lord tarries, that I'm going to leave my body behind, and I'm going to step out into eternity, and I'll finally get to meet my Savior face to face. There is, it is appointed unto men once to die. But here's the thing. We have no idea when that appointment is. If you were to step into my study, you'll see in my day planner, I have appointments for everything. Well, I'm training with Sam at this time, and I have this doctor's appointments. The older I get, there are more doctor's appointments on there. They call these the golden years because of all the gold you need to pay the doctors. I'm, I'm convinced of that. Uh, I have all these appointments, but you'll not find in my, my planner anywhere this will be the day when I step out into eternity because none of us knows that. Truth is, unless you're on death row and it's already been announced that at midnight on such and such a date uh, is the date of execution, none of us knows when that's going to happen. In spite of that, though, we are all convinced that it's a long way out there, isn't it? Doesn't matter how old we are. It's not going to happen today or tomorrow or this year or next year. It's just way out in the distance. I was talking to Pastor Clark on Friday. He called to see how I was doing with the heart thing and all of that. And he said, Monday, if the Lord is willing, I will celebrate my 77th birthday. He said, Brother Mish, how in the world did I get here? How in the world did I get to be this old? I said, I don't know, but I'm glad you did because we sure, we sure do need you around. But even at 77, we, all, we still have plans and all that. I'm not 77. I'm so much younger than that. You say, how much younger? It is none of your business, but I'm ready for Medicare. Um, uh, we don't know when it's coming, but we think it's out there. We're like the rich fool in the parable the Savior told of a man who, uh, who uh, his crops came in and he said, uh, uh, you know, I, I've got all of this. He said, I'm going to build, uh, tear down my barns. I'm going to build bigger ones. And I'm going to take my ease. I'm going to live for many years. And the Lord said unto him, thou fool, this night... Thy soul shall be required of thee. We have the tendency to think, I got a long time to get ready. When there's no guarantee that there's anything beyond now. Wherefore, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart in the provocation. And while it is called today, Hebrews tells us more than once. Today. The question is, are we ready? Are we ready? I watched for two and a half hours on Friday evening the memorial service for a remarkable young man. His name was Benjamin Reimers. 
on July the 3rd of this year, after the fireworks display just down the street from their church in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, he and his sister Emily Grace were walking back to the car along with all of their church family and a young lady lost control of her vehicle. She wasn't drunk, she wasn't high. Something happened, she lost control and she plowed into the crowd and she hit ben, Benjamin and Emily Grace and Ben went home to be with the Lord. He's 24. He's 24. I watched the memorial service as a church and a family just reminisced about a young man that I have met on a couple of occasions. He's been here when his family's visited from out of town. Um, he was a part of his cousin Hannah's wedding and played music, and I, I met him then and so forth. But I couldn't say that I really knew him. I couldn't say that I knew much about him, but I just kind of sat there and listened to his testimony from the lives of all types of people that he touched, his parents, his brother, his sister, uh, classmates, his teachers, dean of, the dean of the college, his pastor, uh, the people that he worked with in areas of music, young people, what we would maybe refer to as bus kids and all of that. I, I was just astounded at scores of people who, who by video and in person were just sharing about this remarkable young man. Ben had no idea that night as he went to the fireworks that uh, that was going to be his last night on this earth. He just thought he, that, that he would see them. He would take his sister home. He'd, he'd go home and Monday morning wake up, celebrate the 4th of July and just begin serving the Lord as he'd always done. He had no idea by the time the night was over, he'd be in the presence of the Lord. But can I just say this? His aunt and uncle were sitting here and I'll just say this and they can confirm or deny if they need to. Benjamin Reimers was ready to be offered. He was ready there was no unfinished business. There was no nothing that he had to fix. He was a young man that was ready to be offered. I wonder, can we say that? Can we honestly say, should the Lord choose today? Am I ready? Well, how do we get ready? How do we get ready? Well, we have some questions we need to ask ourselves. Big ones. Big ones. Are we saved? Jesus taught that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. He cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Marvel not, he said, that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Nobody's going to go to heaven because they were a Baptist. Nobody's going to go to heaven because they were good enough, because there is none righteous, no, not one. No one's going to go to heaven because they were raised in a Christian home. No one's going to go to heaven because they spent their life helping other people for all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. We are all sinners in the sight of God. And I don't care how many churches you join. I don't how, care how many times you get baptized. I don't care how much money you give. It does not change your status as a sinner uh, in one small iota. The only thing that can wash away our sins is the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died on the cross of Calvary to take our place. That is the only sacrifice that God will accept as payment for our sin. No one will go to heaven because they tell God, well, I did this, that, and the other thing. The Savior said in Matthew 7, many there will be in that day that will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have done many wonderful things. And he said, and I will say unto them, depart from me, ye cursed, I never knew you. The issue today is, are you saved? Can you remember the time in your life when you heard that amazing gospel that as a sinner, God loved you and sent you a savior. He died for you, was buried and raised again the third day, conquering sin and death and hell on your behalf. And that salvation is a gift that is offered to you by the grace of God. And by faith, you receive that gift as an act of your own free will. Have you, have you come to a place in your life where that's happened to you? Are we saved? If you're not saved, you are not ready. The, the rich fool in the parable of Christ uh, that Jesus told, uh, I'm going to live for many years. And the Savior said, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. In Luke 16, there was another rich man 
who had everything that life could offer at his gate lay a beggar named Lazarus full of sores. They both died, it seems, at the same time. Lazarus, the beggar, was carried by the angels into Abram's bosom. He didn't have two dimes to rub together in this life, but he had faith in God's plan of salvation, and he was saved, and when it was time to die, he was ready for heaven. The rich man gave no thought of it, though he had a Bible. He knew who Moses was. He knew the scriptures because Abraham said, search the scriptures. They have Moses. They have the prophets. But that man never took it to heart. Uh, He probably, like a lot of people, someday I'll get saved. Just not today. Someday I'll get serious about this. Just not today. Well, someday came and went and he wasn't ready. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes being in torments. You're not ready if you're not saved. If you are saved... There's part of you right now that's rejoicing about this point of the sermon. In just a few weeks, in in early August, I will celebrate my 50th anniversary of being a born-again Christian. I was 14 years of age, and I remember the day so clearly when God spoke to my heart, and I yielded to him, and I trusted Christ as my Savior. And I've had some close calls over the last 50 years, but should any one of them been the call, I'd have been in heaven. Even with what's going on right now, I have no guarantee how it's going to turn out any more than you do. You have no guarantee how today's going to turn out, but I'm not worried about what comes next because I'm ready. I've been saved. Paul said, I'm ready to be offered. Are you ready? So we ask ourselves, are we saved? Number two, have we left anything undone? Have we left anything undone? Paul made an amazing statement in Acts chapter 20 and verse 26. He said, Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. There's no one I've come in contact with that I'm guilty of not sharing Christ with them. I've left no stone unturned. I've left no opportunity go by. He said, I am pure from the blood of all men. What a determined Christian to be able to say that. Is there anything left to be done? Is there anything God's called you to do that you've not yet finished, maybe not even started? Is there a relationship that you know needs to be fixed, but you have not taken a single step in that direction? Is there something undone? Are there things in your life that God's been dealing with you about that you know need to go, but you've not yet done it. You say, someday I will, but what if today is all we get? I'm not trying to be negative. I'm not trying to be harsh. I am trying to be biblical. What if today's all we get? Is there anything left undone? Who are we going to take with us? Who are we going to take with us? Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he said, for what is our hope? or joy, or crown of rejoicing, are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his glory, for ye are our glory and joy. Do you know, I, the Lord's blessed me with a nice car, but when I go to heaven, my car doesn't. It stays behind. And Hyundai gets it back. I get to live in a nice house. It stays behind, and you figure it out. Um... I've got a fifty-five, sixty thousand dollar piece of hardware in my left leg. It stays behind. I'll give it to Warren, I guess. I don't know. Do you realize the only thing that I get to really take to heaven are the people that I've led to Christ? So who's coming with you? Or is there somebody that you know you're supposed to talk to? And you haven't done it yet. One of my dearest friends does not know the Lord as his Savior. For four years, I've been trying to help him understand. My heart aches the fact that that he could die without Christ. And every day when I go to see him, to work with him, Lord, help me be a good witness. Lord, open up a door, open up a conversation. Lord, I'm not sure how to get through. He's not hostile to me. 
He's just not open to the faith. And I just pray, dear God, don't let his heart be hardened. Keep talking to him. And every now and then he'll initiate a conversation and my heart soars because it realizes something's still going on. There's some people that I'm burdened about. Is there anybody like that in your life? And if so, what are you doing about it? Who are you going to take with us? How will we be remembered? Benjamin Reimers is remembered by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people as a remarkable young man. I I was astounded. At the age of 24. uh, The Bible says even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure or whether it be right. We have teenagers in here. We really don't have a lot of what we call children in here, but even little kids are known. How are you going to be remembered? Are you going to be remembered as somebody that loved the Lord with all your heart, or are you going to be the crank? Always mad, always mean. What are you going to be remembered for? When I was in Michigan, I was preaching for Pastor Tony Petronico, and on Saturday of last week, he asked me to meet with the men of his church uh, and just spend some time with them. And I, I, I spoke to them for a while. We had some question and answer. They just wanted to know how to help their pastor as he goes through these uh, terrible health issues that Tony's dealing with. And in the brief message that I shared with them, I talked about crowning your trial and how that every trial God puts us through is a preparation from the Lord to help somebody else down the road going through the same thing. And I talked about how, as an amputee, I am able to reach out and communicate and identify and help other amputees. I know their fear. I know their struggles. I know their pain. And the Lord's used it to open a lot of doors for me that I wouldn't have had otherwise. So God uses trials like that. When I was finished and I went to sit down, Brother Tony got up and... um, some of you may understand uh, a little bit about this. He said, I can't relate to, to Pastor Bish and, and, and his ministry with amputees. He said, but I can talk to drug addicts. And I had totally forgotten that Tony struggled with drugs. I had totally forgotten he went to Rockford, Illinois. He told all about it, so I'm not spilling any beans here. He went to a live-in facility, a Christian place out in Rockford, Illinois with Reformers Unanimous for a long time and, and got his life straight out. God has changed him so much that the memory's not even there what he used to be. By the way, that's called grace. How many here are glad for the grace of God? I, God doesn't remember our sins and iniquities. God casts them into the depths of the sea as far as the east is from the west, but sometimes people don't. I totally forgot, totally forgot. You see, and and I'm not trying to put anybody like that on a pedestal, but I'm just thankful for a testimony of of Brother Tony that he's let God do a work in his life and he is not the person he used to be. Can that be said about us? Can that be said about us? Oh, we, we haven't arrived. Anybody here arrived? You got the whole Christian life thing down? If so, I need you to sign my prosthetic leg afterwards. Okay, and then hit the altar for lying. Uh, None of us have arrived, but we ought to be changing. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How are we going to be remembered when we step out into eternity? What will be waiting for us? If your Bibles are still open by chance to 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul said in verse 6, for I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I believe he knew his date of execution. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Paul was confident that when he finished his journey, his time of departure happened There was a crown of righteousness waiting on him because the Lord promised it. So what's waiting for you? 1 Corinthians 3, the Apostle Paul wrote about how when when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ and we are all going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. As believers, we're not being judged. Am I going to go to heaven or hell? That got settled the day you got saved. But it's about reward or loss of reward. 
everything we live for in life is going to go through the fire. And that which is burnt up is just gone. But that which remains, the gold, the silver, the precious stones, those things that withstand fire, those are the ones that earn us a reward in heaven. And some of the things we waste our lives on are wood, hay, and stubble. Not necessarily sinful, but they don't matter for eternity. But that which is done for the Lord Jesus Christ, that's eternal. So, so child of God, what are you investing in? Are you using your time, talent, and treasure to make a difference for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or is it all about who has the most toys wins? Is it all about what's easy, what's fun? Or is it about what matters to God? Paul said, I've lived my life in every way I know how for the glory of God. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So here's this man at the end of his life. And there's one thing that's missing. There aren't any regrets. Boy, I wish I, I wish I'd have done this. Oh, I wish I hadn't. I, I, there were no, you don't find it anywhere in there. You find a man that said, I finished my course. I've done what God called me to do. I, I'm pure from the blood of all men. I've run my race the way I was supposed to. I am ready to be offered. Let's see, 16 years ago this summer, May, my health journey started. I was in intensive care in Chesapeake, Virginia. The doctors had not told me how bad things were. That They, they had told Trina. She was told to call the family in. And though they didn't talk about it in front of me, I started figuring it out. They flew my kids down from Michigan, from Bible College. Somebody from the church, Mark and Candy Seely, drove Anna down from here. My brother and sister showed up. And none of them said a word to me, but my mind was worrying. I, I knew every breath was a struggle. I knew the pain. I knew the weakness. And I just figured it out. I thought it was time for me to step out. And I remember the night I laid there crying, talking to the Lord about it. Couldn't talk to anybody else, didn't have the energy. And I was just talking to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm not going to get to see my kids get married. I'm not going to meet my grandchildren. And kind of on and on with some of those things. What really made me cry was the regret. Lord, I didn't get to tell my church family goodbye. Because I left thinking I was just gone for a weekend and I'd be back on Monday. I did not get to tell them goodbye. That's a regret. It wasn't something that was my fault. It wasn't something that I neglected, but it hurt. I'm going to understand regret. Paul said, I'm ready to be offered. You're looking at a man that's in prison, forsaken by most everybody, but there's not a regret in my being, not a one, I'm ready. Hey, church, are we ready? How many can say, preacher, I'm saved and I know it. I can look back to the time in my life where I understood the gospel and I received Christ as Savior and Pastor. If I died today, there's no doubt in my mind I'd be in heaven. I have a Bible reason for that. How many of that's your testimony? Isn't that awesome truth to know? Would you put down your hand by your head? Father, I love you. Thank you for the testimony of a man like the Apostle Paul. An unassuming man. A man who had the same kind of flesh that we have. Same kind of struggles that we have. And yet he just yielded his life to Christ in a manner that most of us still don't quite comprehend. And Lord, his testimony at the end of his life has just stirred me again. I'm ready. I'm ready. Lord, I pray that as the people of God, there would be something in our hearts today that says, if I'm not ready, I'm going to get ready. I need to change whatever God wants me to change so that when it's my time, my appointed time, I can say with confidence and boldness, with absolutely no regrets, I'm ready to be offered. 
It may be that there's someone that we have put off witnessing to. Maybe unfinished business, maybe that we've not even started. It might be the mending of a relationship that we've never taken the first step in doing. Lord, I know that you spoke to hearts today. I know you spoke to mine. So now the question is, will we listen to the voice of God? Would you bless our invitation today? Thank you for these that know Christ. Thank you for giving them that Bible assurance that they can know for sure that they have eternal life. But if there's anyone here listening at home that doesn't have that, please, please, God, work in their heart. Don't let them put it off for another day. May they realize this is their appointed time to meet Christ as their Savior. With our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, I wonder, is there anyone here to say, Pastor Bish, I am not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure if I died right now that I'd go to heaven. Please pray for me. If that is your prayer request, could you just slip up your hand wherever you're seated? Nobody's looking around. I just want to pray for you. Yes, God bless you. I see two hands. God bless you. Thank you for that. Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm going to go to heaven. Just pray for me. Just slip it up. Put it down. Just like to pray for you. In a moment, we'll have an invitation. When that comes, if you raised your hand just now, I'm going to encourage you just to be ready. Why don't you come and see Brother Adam, Brother Rob, and somebody sit down with the Bible and help you through the gospel, help you understand how to be saved. Make sure you know. Hey, Christian, is there anything the Lord talked to you about today? Anything that he said, hey, you, you need to pay attention to this. I wonder if there's somebody to say, Pastor, God did speak to my heart today. Some things that really aren't ready. Would you pray that God would help me? I want to finish my course with joy. I want to be ready for that moment. No regrets. Would you pray for me? Is there anybody like that today? Just slip up your hand. Many hands all over. God bless you. God bless you. I appreciate the young people thinking about this. Father, please bless the invitation today. Lord, it's one thing for us to hear from you. It's now time for you to hear from us. And Lord, for everybody to whom you've spoken today, I pray they'd use these next moments of invitation to pray at their seat, to come to an altar, and just deal with it. Make things as right with you as they can. For those who are uncertain of their salvation, please, Lord, grant them the boldness and the strength just to step out and let somebody show them from the Bible how to be saved. Just please anoint this invitation in a real special way. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we stand together? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to ask the pianist just to begin a song of invitation. You raised your hand for whatever purpose this morning. Why don't you slip out of your seat and... The altar is open. You can pray at your seat. If you're not sure you're saved, Brother Adam, Brother Rob are here at the front. If you've been saved but not scripturally baptized since that time, water's warm, robes and towels are ready for you. If you need to join the church, you've been saved and baptized by immersion, why don't you come see these gentlemen? We'll take care of that this morning. I am ready to be offered. Time of my departure is at hand. I have no idea when my time is going to come. But boy, I want to be like Paul and just be ready. I want to be like that young man, Benjamin Reimers. Ready at 24, more than most people three times his age are. I appreciate that testimony. It has spurred me on my own walk with God. Thank you. Would you be seated just for a moment? A few quick announcements. At 4.45 this afternoon, there'll be a deacon's meeting in my study. 5.30 every Sunday, we have uh, 
what we call pastor's prayer mar uh, partners. We invite any teenage young men or adult men to come join me in my study, and we just have a, a time of prayer before the evening service. We share some requests, some burdens, and so forth. And men, you're invited to join us. Again, I said at 6 o'clock, Brother Zach Kinsman uh, will be here with us tonight, and I know it will be an uplifting service in many ways for you. Sunday school teachers, your new lessons are available on the office counter. Please stop by and pick those up. The Phil New England campaign is over. I think in the matter of 15 days, uh, some 35 to 40,000 gospel tracts went out by churches just like ours throughout New England. There were about 15 uh, or 16 different churches that were involved in that. Uh, it's been exciting to hear some testimonies from our folks. We're still going out every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Families join us. Uh, lots more tracts to, to uh, pass out, people to cover, and a lot of things going on. So Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, uh, please join us for that. Teenagers, there's no activity this coming Friday. Friday night, but the following week on the 29th will be Water Wars. Uh, that's always fun, and Brother Rob will sort of give you the details getting you ready for that one. And uh, we've got a few birthdays. Tomorrow is Julianne Graff's birthday, and I think they are out of town today, so we'll, maybe they'll be back tonight. We'll catch her. Uh, I know the Urbanowitzes are out of town. Wednesday is Jack's uh, birthday, and Saturday's Charlie Weinshank. Charlie, wave at us. He is Thing from the Adams family, and uh, Charlie's birthday is on uh, Saturday of this week. Anybody else in here with a birthday this coming week, and we've missed you? All right, it's all for Charlie. Let's sing to him. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And today is Carson and Michaela's wedding anniversary, am I correct? It is number one. It is their very first anniversary, so congratulations to you. Still smiling. I'm going to see that same look in 50 years when I'm, when I'm 30. Uh, let's all stand together. By the way, anybody else with an anniversary, we, we miss you? No, let's all stand. Brother Rob, would you come close us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us, God. Thank you for the testimony that we heard and, and the challenge that we heard. Uh, God, I pray that you would help us to, to put into practice what we've heard and to, to uh, allow it to, uh, to just take root in our lives and in our, our actions, our, our mindset. God, I pray that you would just change us as a result of what we've heard today. Help us not to forget it. Help us to uh, meditate on it and dwell on it. And let it become part of who we are, that we might, uh, we might glorify you in our lives here on earth. God, I thank you for what we heard. I pray that you bless us now as we go. Keep us safe and then bring us back again tonight to hear more from your word. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here today. You are dismissed. Uh -huh.